Uh, hello, everyone, and good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone this evening. My name is Chinny Okalido. I'm the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Depop, and I'm very, very excited to welcome you to Black in Fashion, a conversation with three incredibly talented and truly inspirational Black designers, Priya Aluwalia, Nicholas Daly, and Bianca Saunders. Uh, we're also joined by the equally inspiring Tarek Fontenelle from On Road, a strategic insights agency that we've been working with over the last few months and that they're absolutely amazing. Um, so tonight's event is brought to you by Depop and the British Fashion Council as part of our Black History Month celebrations. All month long, we've been celebrating the limitless creativity of the Black community. From our staff to our sellers to the wider fashion industry, Depop is a platform for Black Creatives, for Black History Month, and always. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tarek. I hope you enjoy the conversation and you leave inspired. Over to you, Tarek. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this, this uh, afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to keep my own speaking to a minimum so I can let these wonderful designers, um, you know, tell them, tell, tell, uh, tell us their, their bits. Um, and we're actually going to start with a little icebreaker. Uh, and yeah, you know, we just want to kind of get to get a little bit under the skin of, of the um, free designers here. So why don't we start with a little icebreak, which is uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given over the years? Uh, mine is actually make your own luck, something I try and live by every single day. Um, so yeah, what's, what's yours? Over to you guys. I, I think mine would be just enjoying the journey and just not stressing too much. Mine's kind of similar to Bianca's. I think mine is... Um, take everything really seriously and not seriously at the same time. So keep it focused, but also, yeah, try and enjoy it as well. For me, everything I do see is a, it's a labor of love. And I think, that, and I, I learned that from one of the tailors, which I worked with when I was at, um, during my studies. And uh, he said, the main thing about fashion and your business and life is everything you do has to be about a labor of love and you really have to love what you're doing or, you know, it, you're not going to get to the right places you want to take it. So that's why I try and use it as a mantra to, to keep okay. things going. Love that. How's, how's that served you over over the years? Labour of love? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's just a little thing. I guess you pick up these quotes from people along the way, whether it's tutors or parents or um, other creatives, you know, just finding these little sort of nuggets of in, in, inspirational wise words um so labor of love that that's something which always stays with me nice so we're going to get started asking a little bit about your early experiences in fashion um and i think it'd be great to like hear a little bit about your early kind of journey in fashion how you started out and you know that that kind of uh those early steps you took into the industry um, yeah so i guess i always knew i wanted to be a fashion designer i think i thought about it from when I was a kid I was kind of obsessed and so I really I'm quite like an organized person as well and so I kind of like organized my whole education around it I knew exactly like what I wanted to do where I wanted to go I interned as much as I could from the first year of my of university and I just really tried to like you know I guess network maybe um but yeah so I think I um I had been really focused from the beginning and um, I've worked a bit and then I did my master's and I think that's really where I found my um, feet or my independent like and unique I guess hope it's unique uh, design sort of mantra and so yeah it started like that really. Um, what about you Bianca? Um, I guess similar to Priya so I've kind of like always knew I wanted to do something around like design or whether it was art um, so literally from foundation it's kind of been non-stop um, I kind of like fitted everything else in between um, and had like a, a steady plan of what, what I wanted to become and how I wanted to actually do it so like doing my masters was like the main plan of how I could conceptualize my own brand um, so from there it was easy to kind of like launch it into what it's become now and what about you Nick? Um, mine was, it wasn't, I didn't wake up and think, oh, I'm going to be a designer. I was actually really into sport, you know, I'm 6'4", played everything, golf, judo, rugby. I thought that was going to be me, but, um, the creative energy and, and, and that was always been a big part of it. And, you know, on my dad's side, my grandfather, he was a cobbler back in Jamaica and 
you know, he made his own bamboo saxophone. And then on my mom's side, they've been knitting and crocheting like throughout all my mom's family. And that's like a big tradition in Scotland and um, within my ancestry on my mom's side. So I think it's like just a combination of this DIY, you know, my mom grew up on a really, a really sort of bad estate in Dundee um, called that's Lockie, which is still to this day, you know, there's a lot of changes in Dundee and it's amazing to kind of see the progress of it. And then on my dad's side, he literally grew up in Bush in St. Anne's right up near Nine Mile where, where Marley's at. And, and I've been there and he showed me the well he made with his uncles. And I'm just like, wow, this thing's still here. So when you, when both my parents, I guess, distilled this idea of like, you know, when you don't have much, you know, this idea of making things and craft and tradition. So I think definitely that was also like, without me even knowing it, like a foundation for, 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 for kind of my ideas and ethos and design and, and, and creating something from, from, from scratch. Amazing. Um, designing trainers when I was playing basketball, I was designing loads of trainers trying to create the next Jordan or whatever. And that's where it started really. So my love of sport and then fusing it with fashion and then the creative thing just carried on and and, and lucky enough to go to a really good university at Central St. Martins to do my BA and everything else is sort of snowballed from there. Yeah, I was lucky enough to, I got, I, when did we meet Nick? We met probably over 10 years ago now, man. And I remember- yeah, a while, bro. A while back. And you know, like what I always struck me about you and your like, Group, the group of like people you had around me is just how much graft you put in. Like you were grafting round the clock, like every night hustling, like, you know, like getting, getting, you know, getting materials, scrapping the stuff and like putting stuff together. You could see that, you know, like um, you were facing challenges, but you, you know, you overcame it, you know, one way with graft as much as, much as talent. Um, and I'm, yeah, I suppose that's, you know, that's where I'm interested in taking the next question, you know, like what, uh, we'd like to understand a little bit more about you know some of the challenges you faced as a young designer, particularly. Um, and I'd love to hear about some of the obstacles some of you faced and like how you overcame them. I think at the moment it's still like because we're in difficult times, there's still a lot of things that we're I guess overcoming and then learning as we're going along. Um, I think particularly for myself because there's different stages. Like every every like six months is like a new stage to my career and a different like level. Um, in terms of being a designer and actually having my own brand. Um, I think the diff most difficult stage was like the first year um, of having the brand. I feel like now I was kind of, I'm kind of like getting a bit, bit more into the speed of like being, like managing a team and like being the head of like creative and like actually making decisions, like even the most smallest steps. But I think what I'm enjoying the most is being able to, put my vision out there and I feel like I, I exactly what I set out to do in the beginning is what it's becoming now um, and that's quite powerful for myself. We don't, well I don't know about Bianca and, and Nicholas but like I don't have a fully fledged accounts team that's checking up and like chasing payments for me and so sometimes that can be uh, difficult and you, you know you have to wear a lot of different hats so like you know, I'm a designer, I like doing all the creative but at the same time we, I have to do like all the day-to-day -day business stuff, strategy, um, marketing ideas so you have to wear a lot of hats but at the same time as that um the no cash flow I try and be positive about it all that not no cash flow but like not completely stable is like one good thing is like it makes you resourceful and it makes you think of like clever ways to get out of things or um new ways to work or ideas that we can like push the brand forward um, without necessarily having the budget of a conglomerate um and then also another thing you know that I've been talking, having a lot of conversations with bigger companies that I'm partnering with at the moment is that like some partnerships I do with huge businesses, it takes like three weeks to get an answer for about anything because there's such a chain of command and there's so many people. But I think that what, you know, me, Nicholas and Bianca have all got on our side is that we can be agile. If we want to decide something today and do it tomorrow, we can just do it like that. So I think, um, that's a positive of, of the uh, the small resources and the small teams. It means that we can still be, you know, the boss. No, sure. absolutely. And I think that agility, I think, you know, as kind of Bianca touched upon, you know, we are living in really tumultuous times and having that ability to kind of pivot and be agile um, with the kind of work that you do and what you put out is so important, I think. Um, what about you, Nick? 
for me, like I put my heart and soul in my graduate collection. I was still working at retail to help support that. You know, finance is obviously a big thing, being resourceful with the, and then I put everything into it. And I thought, you know, when I graduate, I, you know, at least I want to turn around and look at myself in the mirror and say, I, I did everything. So that's why, you know, you probably saw me back in the day, Terry, like, you know, you know, I haven't seen me in weeks because I've just been in the studio <laughs> in the at Charing Cross trying to get it all done. Um, but it was worth it. And, you know, I was lucky that store in Japan, um, Beams Japan, International Gallery Beams, they picked me up from a graduate collection and um, slowly just built from there. So I didn't necessarily have a game plan, you know, straight out of uni, I want to have a Nicholas Daly brand. I was just fortunate that, that a store, a whole mil miles on my oh, the other side of, you know, um, had picked me up. And when I told my parents, oh, Beams had bought me, they thought there was like Beams for the house. <laughs> Because I had no idea what Beams was. And I was like, what do you mean Beams? Beams? Oh, yeah. And I was like, no, it's this store in Japan. It's really cool. It's, it's had loads of amazing brands. And um, it's uh, had a lot of British brands. Where they've stopped. Like, they're one of the earliest stockers of Joe Casey Aper, which I'm sure we'll jump on to. So, you know, um, for me, yeah, that's kind of where it kind of started with Japan. And then just building and growing and, you know, and then applying for New Gen with the British Fashion Council. And they've been really amazing in, in supporting and allowing to have me that time at London Fashion Week, um, mentoring, um, a lot of um, internal stuff, which obviously Priya was touching on where we do wear loads of hats <laughs> and it is so overwhelming. And there, there's times where the design side of things just seems to be doing this. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and everything we're doing else is the, the, the economics and the business side. So. You have to like, you know, um, be savvy, graft and, you know, have good uh, external network like the BFC or other mentoring programs or collaboration projects. Because, you know, that's how you learn as a designer. It's it's uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a labor of love. So <laughs> you have to love this every part of it, even if you don't want to, whether it's a spreadsheet designing a collection or working on some photo shoot, you know, you have to put your heart and soul into to everything and, 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 and try and graft and adapt, so. I think it's interesting because one of the, one thing that I see is unique running through all three of your kind of um, outputs, you can really clearly see, you know, you've, uh, you've uh, taken from your cultural her heritages in each, in each case. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear a little bit about how um, much of an impact that's kind of had on each of your, um, one, one, yes, design, but also in terms of how you operate your businesses. Cause you know, like being a black, uh, a black designer in this, in, in the industry, you know, it has um, its challenges as well as its, um, you know, its, its benefits as well. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, your experiences as a black designer um, entering the industry. Um, yeah, the positives, negatives, any interesting stories really. I just want to start by saying that I think it's a really it's like an, an interesting time uh, because like there is sitting here like me, Bianca and Nicholas, and there's also like a host of other designers, especially in London that are from like Afro-Caribbean backgrounds. And I, I think that what's really like nice and important to like highlight is like, yes, me, Bianca and Nicholas all look really heavily into our heritage, um, but our work is so different to each other. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's a really nice time to see that there is black stories are not one dimensional and I think when I was growing up watching fashion shows or reading magazines like, we didn't really have much representation and it was always like African and Caribbean stories were always through a European gaze and it was always like a huge Paris house doing like a uh, safari collection or whatever whatever it was and I think that um the, the key, the thing for me that I'm really proud of and proud to be a part of a generation is like that we're getting the platform to show that we're more nuanced than a costume and we're more nuanced than a drama, whatever it is. And, and I think that like it shows in all our work that they're, they're so different and it doesn't necessarily, you know, if you pick up, if, if someone walked into a store and picked up like Alawalia, Bianca Saunders or Nicholas Daly and they knew nothing about us. They wouldn't necessarily know everything. Whereas I think before loads of collections around the African diaspora have been characterized by costume elements. And so you'd pick it up and be like, oh, this was inspired by Africa, even though Africa's 54 countries and it's very diverse. So 
I just wanted to start by saying that basically I'm like happy to really happy to be a part of it and um, I guess in my work it's nuanced I'm constantly looking at like family photos um, researching like artists scholars or po- politi- politicians or whatever it is you know so like periods in sociology um, around both countries that I'm from but also how that's happened how that has been affected by migration to the UK and um yeah it's a big it's a big melting pot of things and I guess my research makes sense to me other people might think it's a bit random but I Mm. follow a thread no I I love that and you know I think you just touched on a really important point there you know like there's a thing there where actually blackness is just inherently politicized so often you know and I think like it's interesting because it comes really can become really uh, you know, like that can become really obvious in, in the fashion industry. Um, but you've also touched on something really interesting, which I think, you know, what something we carry through in the Black on Depot campaign is just that idea around like limitlessness in the black experience. Once upon a time, you know, being black was always pigeonholed. It was like, it fit into like neat boxes that, you know, effectively, you know, Western society have, has uh, shaped out for us and then, you know, put you in it. It was always urban. It was always, you're this, you're that. But actually you know, in 2020, there's absolutely no limit to what blackness looks like. And I think that's one of the great things I see in all three of your works. You know, it comes through uh, so strongly in all of your work. And it's, that's amazing. Yeah, I think, I think I find it like quite difficult to kind of, um, I don't know, especially like this year as well too, I feel it's been quite hard because like there's many designers that are not black, um, mostly just white designers they're just like allowed to exist and tell their stories about like who they come across their family background and it's not it's not it's not political and it's just like it's okay and then like it, when because my work's based on people that I know and like my surroundings and that sort of stuff and that's how I kind of like got into making work of myself was because when I was at do my BA at Kingston University I a lot of the stuff I'll look at was like quite abstract. And then the first exhibition I actually came across was like the Return of the Brood Boy, which is at Somerset House. And for me, that was like a massive turning point because I was like, I'd never seen like Caribbean culture and like British culture combined and seeing like tailoring and that sort of stuff um, being, being put on a prestigious level as the Somerset House. And, and me being like, I don't know how old it was, probably at like 19 or something like that it was like a special thing for me and I really wanted to show people in my class because I was the only black person in my throughout like in my year at RCA and also at Kingston so I wanted to be able to explain myself through my work and that's what it kind of became and then I was lucky enough to have like shooters like Andrew EB who was able to um almost like guide me in the right direction as well as like push me in terms of like my research and like how I actually explored my own identity without it becoming very like sur- surface level and that's that's another thing that's like trying to like dictate and I feel like even this year of like my most recent work I feel as though it's been quite difficult people to like separate the image of like who I am and seeing like the design and like the the craftsmanship and I feel like it's quite frustrating and I don't know if anyone else experiences that but it can it can be seen as that like your your identity kind of overpowers it but you're you're still trying to like do your own personal story so it's just like I'm looking forward to the day where it's like the design is like I wouldn't say it is respected but like yeah. (laughs) Nick is that something you feel do you feel like you know sometimes your the quality of your work is uh, sometimes secondary maybe to um, yourself, your role as a black designer almost, you know? Yeah, because I think it just pushes me to work harder and make sure that people see that I'm a, a good designer, see that I'm like really focused on like designing new things or designing like how I want to present my work and that sort of stuff. So like every season is just like working really hard at like making sure that people really notice that about me and my work and really, I guess, respect that about um, my journey and the brand as well too. No, absolutely. Nick, I don't know if you had, any, did you have anything to add? Everything's so rich and interesting and I'm sort of zoning into Bianca and Pri and I'm kind of like, oh, I'm listening to them and then I'm... This question kind of became one around the kind of inherent politicization of being a black designer. Um, and I think it's interesting, like maybe your perspective, one perspective I think would be interesting to hear from you is 
how you've seen that change over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Mm. Um, you know, I think it, one thing I, you know, the, even if, uh, I, if the subject matter hasn't sh- changed a huge amount, some, I feel like the mediums that we discuss these conversations is changing, developing and in some mm. way, uh, you know, advancing. Yeah, no, definitely. I think advancing is the right word. Like, you know, look at us here, you know, Bianca, Priya and the whole roster of designers coming through the BFC and the progress made there. They're trying to build that confidence that, yes, we can do it. Um, and, you know, going back to, to Joe Casey Hayford and like when I was, I went to their, their show at London Fashion Week and I kind of, I kind of was, was, was friends with Charlie as well. I'll put you on, you know, the list to go to see the show and just seeing, you know, a far a black father son duo having their show at London Fashion Week. Whilst I was here, Sam was like, oh, you know what? I think I can actually do this. You know, like this is possible. Um, just keep breaking those sort of um those sort of levels and um and you know, a bit like with Bianca going to, you know, the returns to the Rude Boy exhibition, which Harris um put together so great. Um and I think you, you you do do. I think when you are a um, designer of color, you do need those moments where it's like, you know what, like I can do that. There is that possibility. And I think what we are as designers here, you know, without unconsciously unconsciously knowing it, the ripples effect of all our stories. Because for me, I see us as the same tree, but we're all different branches. That's yeah. that's that's my why. Well, me, Bianca, Priya. Um, other designers of color, we go through those same struggles or those same dilemmas and which our white ca- counterparts don't go through. And this tree and the different branches, it's so rich. Like our, our cultures are so rich and it's, and it's, and, and economically it's, you know, people are, uh, are constantly, you know, appropriating and changing and, and, and for us to tell our, our stories from our tree <laughs> through our branches <laughs> is what needs to be done. And that's what, in terms of advancement, you know, both creatively and economically, because we're three black owners, you know, we have businesses and that's what I feel is even more integral is the economics and black owned businesses. That's where real change um, can happen and how then we feed out and how we pull in, you know, through our collaborations, who we work with, what factories we work with, how we do it, you know, and then we can make, we are then becoming the gatekeepers mm. of our own destiny and how we choose to financially, creatively and culturally, you know, try and change the landscape. So I think, you know, that's what I feel is, is, it is exciting about now because, you know, even within my time frame, you know, and seeing the designers and more designers coming through and when I'm, going to lecture at CSM or Leeds or et cetera. And then, you know, you start to see more, more designers of color or more students wanting to give it a go. Cause you got to think as well, like when I told my parents or my dad, especially, I want to do fashion design. He was like, what? <laughs> he just, I just gave him that, that screw face. And I was like, you know, fashion design He's like tailoring. I was like, no fashion design. No, no, you're going to be a tailor. Right. Cause like, I think, you know, and that's the generational thing as well, which we deal with uh, as well. I'm not sure how Bianca and Priya, but like, you know, when, when you know, I guess the stereotype or not the stereotype, but our parents want us to be safe and secure and positions of, you know, an accountant or a tradesman, you know, get a trade, get a trade, you know. <laughs> and and for me, you know, my parents did give me so much um, uh uh, confidence and 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 get, letting me do what I really wanted to do, you know, because I was really really passionate. I was like, look, I, I want to go to CSM. This is this place where you know you Galliano's or whatever. And um, I'm I'm a mum thought the fashion industry was going to eat me up and spit me out with all these stories of you know the late nights, which do happen. Like the industry is not perfect, but it has its dark side. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, I think now, like now that my parents, now that I've built my business and my brand to this level and, you know, they've been in my shows, my dad's DJ videos, like they're, 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 they're my dad's calling me, oh, why is your website not up yet? You know, da, 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 da. and he knows Bianca and Priya, my dad's, oh, you know, Bianca and Priya. Yeah, yeah. So now, so now he's like the opposite. He's gone from, you know, skepticism to full front, 
you know, um, trying to help out, which is really, really sweet and really endearing. So I think, you know, um, to kind of circle back to the question, I think, you know, um, you know, what we're doing as black designers and designers of color with the support of various networks and trying to just keep pushing the agenda forward through economics, creative and, and, and culturally. And I think if we keep doing it, you know, um, then, you know, the next generation behind us, you know, it's just breaking down more doors. No, absolutely, man. I think it's, it's so important. I think like there's that thing where, you know, as an entrepreneur, a black entrepreneur, you're constantly looking at ways that you can bring equity back to your community, to your, to your people. So that's, you know, again, it's like one of those things you have to face potentially that, you know, maybe a white equivalent doesn't have to. And I think like, you know, we, there's constantly these hurdles that you have to face. But, you know, I think, you know, what, one thing which I think, you know, just struck me from all three of your conversations, which I've, you know, just think I'm quite interested in is um, the idea of mentorship. Because for me as a, you know, a young uh, business, uh, a, you know, an entrepreneur myself, you know, I know that I'm, you know, I, I don't know how far I would have got without having incredible mentors around me to like guide me and support me. I just love to hear a little bit about um, your relationship with your mentors, if you have them and, um, you know, like if not, where else you're going to get advice? Um, so I, I have quite a few different mentors. So um, I guess because Andrew is like my tutor at like Kingston and he sort of taught at the RCA as well too. So he became my men mentor, so mentor kind of as well too. Um, and that's like what inspired me to do actually do a master's um, as well as like look into more into menswear. Um, and then I have PC Williams, um, she's a CSM lecturer and tutor. Um, Kenya Hunt, who is the fashion director of Grantian Magazine. And she started a program whilst I was at the Royal College of Art. Um, and then now I've become a mentor myself, which has been quite interesting. Um, and then, yes, Karen Bins, we work closely together. She's my stylist, but she's also like someone that knows literally everything. So we literally speak, after every shoot, we have like at least an hour conversation or something, or like anything I need to like speak to her about, she's literally there. But I, I think I've really been able to push myself forward by having people that look like me as my mentors as well as, but even though outside of that, I did have, a lot of the tutors that were at um, RCA and Kingston, white or black, they were they were quite supportive of my work and they saw like my potential. So they did equally push me forward. But I, I really did rely on the people that were older than me of colour to um, yeah gain that confidence to do what I'm doing now. I, I suppose these are people who are already in your like direct ecosystem, people who came across through for university or through your wider networks. Um, kind of, and then some people. I think there were stages like throughout studying. I felt a bit lost, so I did seek those people out. Like if I if I followed them, I would message them like, "Oh, I really want to get your advice on this," or like, "Are you like what you're doing?" And like that's that's what sort of helped build the brand a bit because then I ended up becoming like really good friends with them and that sort of thing. Now they see me grow. There's I mean there was this there was this furniture designer. I don't know who they are, but I messaged them about meeting up and the next thing you know we was actually working on something together um and I was like I remember that time I messaged you randomly um <laughs> to ask for advice and it never even happened but yeah I've just actually been sitting here listening to Bianca trying to rack my brains for like someone that I could tell you is a mentor and like I don't feel like I have one um and I hope I'm not offending someone by saying that but I, I really don't think I've had that but what I will say is that um for the first two years of my business I was a little bit like Nicola Zambianca like I didn't plan to have a brand um I did my graduate collection and was approached by LNCC an opening ceremony that wanted to make an order so I hit the ground running and for the past sort of like two years it's been a whirlwind you know I've worked closely with Bianca and Nicholas both like we've done different things we and Nicholas were in Paris for Adidas and so I've just been like ducking and diving trying to figure it all out and I, but now one of my real like agendas um and key bits of focusing is is actually like I don't want this to be a glorified art project so I'm really thinking about how this can be a business and I, you know listen don't get me wrong it's doing well I'm doing all right but I want to make sure I can extend that and support more and more people have a bigger team and you know 
I do a lot of things with within the community, like supporting like not so much since COVID, but like different schools and things like that. So I want to carry that on. So I guess that one thing I'm doing now is seeking out mentorship. Um, and the way I've been approaching it um, is some things were a bit official. Like for example, me and Nicholas have got mentorship from LVMH because we were both a part of the prize and me and Bianca will be getting some from matches. So like some of it's more official channels and then um, other things is I've been really fortunate to do some great projects with people that are at much bigger companies or um, have a lot of things. Loads of things I want us to talk about. I'm actually like under NDAs and stuff. So I've got to be like careful. I don't slip up, but basically what I'm, what I'm, ta- you know, I guess it's a tactic now going forward with my partnerships and bigger companies that, you know, come to me, whether that's about design or whether that's sustainability or whatever it is, is factoring that idea of mentorship in. So like if I'm talking to someone at somewhere, don't want to say anything wrong, then I'll say, do you know what, can I, is it okay? Could I be connected with the person that works there? So I guess I'm trying to um, catch up to Bianca and her mentors. Um, but yeah, definitely think it's uh, something I need to do a bit more. Okay. And I do, as, like Bianca as well, I mentor people as well now. So, nice. but maybe I should have been mentored before I mentored people. I don't know, who knows? Hopefully I'm doing all right. What about you, Nick? Obvious, like for me, the obvious thing is my parents, you know, and I think they are your first mentors, your first you know, people who guide you into this world. And, you know, my parents always said you have to work extra hard, you know, you know, you have to do better at school. The percentages of me getting a degree, the percentages of me going to jail, the percentage of me getting, you know, not 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 being in an economical place as my white counterparts. And, you know, I definitely feel, you know, they made sure that I was in an environment and, you know, worked really hard um, to get where I am. So, but also, you know, music plays a big thing for me. And, you know, my parents, they ran a reggae club together when they first met back in Scotland. And they did that for like bringing people together through music, just bringing people together. And I think that's a flame which has carried on to me and how I kind of express that through my world and through my work, like doing an after party with like Mongo's High, if I am Mala and Zakia and the beer all playing like after the show and I know Bianca and Priya have also done things similar, you know, um, trying to bring our communities together and, and as well as the fashion, it's also, that's what I feel really, really strongly about. So I think definitely um, my parents distilled both of those, those, those things. And then from a fashion perspective, like um, a bit like what uh, Priya was saying, you know, the the mentoring schemes with the BFC and with LVMH, but also just through the collaborations, like with Fred Perry, like I've done three collabs with them now. We've just l- launched a new collection and I've learned a lot from them internally, like as a bigger structure and they showed me things and we've, we just did this music together to launch the collection to support British music during a time of absolute chaos obviously with no one being able to play so you know having a good communication and relationship and jargon with you know uh collaborators and stylists or your parents you know for me it's just picking up all these interesting ways of um of trying to build a brand um and i feel you know um steven mann as well who's been styling um a lot of my collections and has been incredible uh and you know working with Kiko as well and Affix, uh, a really amazing eye. So I definitely feel like you do need someone stylistically who gets it um, and kind of can help on that side. So yeah, man, like the mentoring list, it's like, I think, like what I said, it's hard to, and there's so many, you know, who have contributed to my journey to get to this point. Mm-hmm. And if they are watching, big thank you for that. Um, so yeah, I think that's the best advice is just is just try and surround yourself with as many good people from many walks of life, from many different perspectives. You know, not everything your mum and dad said is rubbish. <laughs> so sometimes you might feel that way. Like, why are you telling me that? And then, oh, my dad's right, you know. <laughs> so sometimes you have those moments where, you know, but that comes with experience and, and the more collaborations and the more projects and the more collections you do, your mentoring kind of world does expand. And then I guess myself, Bianca and Prue, we reached this stage now where we're now reversing that and going into universities and, and doing lecturing and trying to be, 
um, proactive on that front now that we have that experience, you know, to help um, give to designers and other creatives um, to try and support them, you know, and help them do follow their dreams as well as, you know. No, actually, that's a really good point. I actually want to stick on that for a moment. So quite interested in, in like, where, how, you know, how you see your roles kind of inspiring the next generation. And I'd be interested, like, hearing a little bit about what you're doing maybe to support this next generation of talent or what you kind of, uh, you, you hope to do maybe. Because I think it's, like, touched on a really important point there. I think, you know, the idea of mentorship, actually, you know, you learn from what you see, you know, and I think, you know, hearing, you know, Bianca looking at some of your, your mentors and listening to Nick as well, you know, a lot of the time it's like you, you being, you know, being, being contemporaries or being people like leading um, in that space, you end up becoming, you know, like figures that people look at. So I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what you guys are doing around kind of supporting next generation and maybe like what you think there should be more of as well. I think it's just, I think it at right now it's just more or less the visibility of it all. Cause I, there's like, I do get some messages sometimes and people are like, oh, so nice to see that like person that's Jamaican or some person that's like black woman that do menswear. And I'm like, oh, wow. That's like, cause sometimes I'm like literally not rushing through the journey of what's happening now, but you kind of get a bit jaded about things. And then it's just a nice reminder to be like, people are actually watching and then being inspired about seeing me in certain positions, I guess being part of the British Fashion Council or like matches and, uh, all the other projects that have been like, but I think it's the same for like everyone that's here. Yeah, and I just want to quickly add as well that I feel like my answer changed a bit about the mentorship and I feel like I've got loads, but they're a bit unofficial maybe. So in case I've offended anyone, because now I'm like cringing a lot. And like, you know, even actually like Bianca and Nicholas are both my friends and they both, we've I think we've all helped each other at different stages. And I remember when I was like first coming out and Nicholas helped me with dealing with like, big companies quite a lot so I've definitely remember that so thanks for that Nicholas <laughs> but I think me going forward is definitely the visibility thing like um it's it's so difficult because like you know like we're having this conversation now because we are black um and I know that Nicholas and Bianca are probably feeling the same we get loads of requests like can you answer this about being black can you do this about being black and sometimes it's like I want to answer it all because I know that visibility is really good and I know that if someone's picking up this magazine that lives in a village and they're the only black girl there or the only black guy there it's really good for them to see but then other times it can become like it's it's draining and also it's it feels reductive of like I guess who I am as a person like am I more am I not more than where I'm from but maybe that's everything I am and that I need to so sometimes it's a bit difficult but I guess in terms of like how I'm doing it forward yeah it's definitely through the the visibility and and trying to be um definitely definitely vocal probably some will say too vocal about um topics of discrimination or you know whatever it is um but also I guess I'm trying to before Covid it was a lot easier but I've done stuff with secondary schools especially ones in South London um and then I've worked with the Prince's Trust and Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust and the Southall Black Sisters which are a few charities that support um different areas across the diaspora I guess Southall Black Sisters around domestic violence Stephen Lawrence and Prince's Trust is really about empowering young people especially young people of colour into employment and confidence because you know a lot of a lot of doing well is self-esteem so I think I'm rambling I guess but you know basically what I want to say is a part of it is doing those proactive things but part of like a part of our political statement as us three being creatives is just existing in the space that wasn't made for us like just being on that platform and just not relenting like doing these projects putting ourselves out there that is already protest and I guess that's already representation so I think it's a mixture of just being in that space and then I'm trying to um, in my business plan I'm trying to think of ways that I can support the community um, with certain projects uh, moving forward because I think an, a healthier community is a prosperous one so Nick what what do you wish what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started out you learn more from your mis- from your mistakes than necessarily your accomplishments. And you know when you've ordered the wrong fabric, or you've done something differently, or the collection you wanted, or something. Actually, you learn from that, and you progress much further. And I definitely feel that is something which I a mantra which I definitely like um, 
you know, sort of uh, uh, give advice on. But if I could change anything, I think maybe at the start, just kind of having more of a plan and having someone at that very embryotic stage to kind of really handle or to go through the whole process. I was just lucky that um, in Japan, which I work with, particularly Beams, they were like super, super cool. And, you know, they didn't try and pull any weird legalities on contracts or delivery issues or you know um so i definitely felt i was lucky in that front in terms of getting good stockists to, to start with because you know financially if you don't deliver or something's not right it can can end you before you even start um but i definitely feel like a slow and steady pace and approach building every season building your narrative building your community building your network building your mentors is definitely a way forward because like my plan is to stay in this industry for as long as possible um and you know even putting together my spring 21 collection during lockdown you know i was in the studio on my own um doing fabric selections over zooms and everything and my team was amazing and we still managed to put together not the collection i, I had envisioned but we put something for spring 21 to have it ready um and that just kind of showed me like you know if i can put this together during a global pandemic then you know my team and my and my dedication to this is 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 some either insane or very obviously very enthusiastic because um you know there was a lot going on um but for me it was a cathartic release like i need to create and as i'm sure bianca and priya the same you know that's what we do we we are we are storytellers. We are griots, you know, going way back to Africa. We are, we are, we are the storytellers of, 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 of our cultures and our communities. And if we don't speak the stories, then you know, who else, not saying who else, but you know, we we are stepping up to that plate to 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 keep pushing things forward. I think the same as Nicholas. I really have like it's it it sometimes hurts so much when you make a mistake. And especially one where I've done one, maybe I've measured something wrong or something and it could have been avoidable and it feels catastrophic and it like actually hurts. Like, <laughs> so I guess, but those things have made me learn. And when you make those mistakes, you don't do it again. So like, I feel like, I think those ones are not things I'm necessarily begrudging. But for me, it, uh, what I wish I had learned a bit more about was like the art of negotiation. Um, in terms of and also knowing that knowing my worth as in like knowing the brand's worth you know like I've I've learned now that you know we all of us get tapped into for a lot of partnerships and do this project and do that project but actually like a few things I would say to anyone that's doing any partnerships and projects with big people is like if you do a partnership with someone that means you're saying no to someone else and there's value in that there's value in you going with a rather than b that you know if someone approaches you for a project they want you there if, you know all these different things like and i've done some things for huge companies that are on the stock market and i just think it's not fair you know like to the team that work with me the fact that we've got to put the lights on and pay the rent and now um, I feel like this is my new era of really thinking like I've always been quite business focused because my mum is a really inspirational person in my life and she's a finance director but like now I'm really in this era of like I'm a I am like as Nicholas said a business owner and a boss and so like I'm taking that on and I think if I'd known that a little bit earlier it would have been a bit nice. I would have had some more money, but um, moving forward, I'm not uh, not letting anyone sort of take the mick. I guess so. I think that's one thing I would say. Knowing know, knowing the value in what your idea, what your name, what your logo, what you bring to the table, and making sure that people understand it too. Nice. And I, I love that point around the value and saying no to because you know something which uh, I think all entrepreneurs have to learn potentially the hard way. I think my one would be trying. Sure, and also create your own environment and people that you want like to be a part of that. Like, um, I feel like this whole year, because it's been, I don't know, it's, it's been crazy. Um, it's been quite special for me, but also like it's kind of given me a new newfound confidence because like the people I've met like, last year, I've worked in my multiple projects throughout this year and because we get along creatively, I'm able to like get things done easily. So I already have like 
my my own ideas so like as soon as like, this new project comes along it's like zoom call already I already know who like the set design is going to be I know who like the stylist is going to be I know who uh, who's going to do the makeup and like everyone really wants to see the brand win so like having a strong like base team that like follows you is really important um for my brand and um creatively because then I'm able to like there's no pro- if I don't like something people will know I don't like it there's no like awkwardness or anything like that what would you do differently if you were an emerging designer um graduating in you know 2020 in the in the world of covid how would your perspective on what you did next change i think it would depend on what you want to do as a designer do you want to work for someone or not but i guess 2020 i feel so like my heart goes out to all the all the like designers graduating this year because it's not been easy I think that we have to embrace like I'm quite an analog person but I would say that to embrace digital and like try and make an impact digitally because that's the way you're going to get people around the world to see your things without a show so um you know I know we can talk because we've got businesses now and we can do different things like you know Bianca's beautiful video Nicholas does beautiful videos I did a virtual reality exhibition we've got you know, more means to create something, but how can you be resourceful and do that digitally and make a splash? Um, And also, you know, just think about what have you got to say that's different from anyone else? Because the other thing with the internet and having everyone on it is that there is so much, like there's so much content, there's so many designers, so many. So what can you do? What's, what is individual about you and your story and your beliefs and all of that? And then how can you take that and put it on a screen I guess like I think digital you have to kind of embrace it I don't necessarily love it but you do have to embrace it no it's, it's really interesting because we obviously are in a time where you know companies that can be can react uh, digitally and we talked about agility earlier you know like they're, they're you know they're succeeding through this time so I think you make a really valid point um, I think just kind of like going back to what Nicholas said like um I feel like in the age of like uh, new um students like right everyone's creating at home and I feel like actual designers had to go had to go back to like doing what they were doing at BA and like just literally like doing everything yourself <laughs> and like well that was that was like my stage throughout COVID it was literally like I was able to have to spend time on mannequin and like be creative and that sort of stuff so I feel like allow these times to build your creativity um and like create so it's like almost like creating something out of nothing that's what you have to think and the be- like it kind of is only the strong will survive kind of thing, as harsh it does sound, but it is, <laughs> that, it is what it is. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's what happens when, you know, you hit financial financial difficulties and absolutely like, you know, I think I read the other day, you know, 60% of small businesses have died through this time. And I'm not, you know, you, you can't be surprised considering like uh, the time all the world's going through. So. But I, I also feel like because it depends on your, like, it's always also down to skill set um, because I was able to do a lot of the things myself, then that's the only reason it's been able to, I guess, well, I don't know, we're still going through it at the moment, but able to survive. Yeah, I think I think for the students coming out now in 2020, you know, like what Priya said, embrace the digital age, like, you know, from the biggest houses to us, to, to be a, everyone's adapting and changing probably for the foreseeable future, but like I said, if you have a great team, which I do, and um, you 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 problem solve and try to do the best you can and still deliver something great. Um, but I do think, you know, stick to your guns, tell an authentic story, your story. Like for me, I've kind of adopted three C's, which I actually coined during the LVMH process, which Priya touched on, because we had to speak to so many different um, people within the industry. And you've just got five minutes just to like tell, tell, to tell your piece. And I was like, community, craftsmanship and culture, that is Nicholas Daly. That, that is my mission. That's what I'm doing with my brand. So the three C's is my thing. And I would say to, to any designer, black, white, Chinese, et cetera, like know your, know your core, like, you know, who you are, your identity, your story. Because that, like, whether it's, uh, you know, Pre doing a book with Jalebi or Bianca doing her show in Paris, you know, whatever your story is, um, you can transform that and turn it into anything. And, and that's where being a good designer is. When I look at the greats like Ray Kawakubi or Yoji Yamamoto or Paul Smith or whoever, you know, they've, 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 they've adapted and changed their creative hand to multiple things. 
you know mm. so i definitely feel like you know but you have to have that that core message or that mantra which you stick by you know your kind of code and that code can be uploaded and downloaded and processed <laughs> into multiple forms and you know i'm not expecting everyone to like nicholas daly you know but if you come to my show or you see a collection you see a garment you know hopefully all the those three c's are channeled through it and you know there's designers which i really admire who are on a completely different wavelength and a completely different aesthetic but i'm like shit you know uh i can get it like i get it because i their story i like i can feel it you know you just get that thing in your gut or in your head where you're like you know what that you know i get it and i think that's also something what we have here in the uk as british designers you know all the subcultures rude boys skinheads new romantics you know drill music whatever you know this is this is us in the uk and it's something which like we do as designers so well with our work is like we we just we're just picking all this stuff up and and channeling it for new designers I mean, through I, i'd say that just look at your surrounding look at what you enjoy what you listen to who you hang with like what you know and all of that is is what you process and i think that's always the purest thing to 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 say and that's how i've approached it in terms of my work and that's what i would give to any student um or think someone who's thinking about starting a brand nice i love that cuz you know i think one thing i'm really getting from all three of your responses just how important is to put a team in around you and put the right people around you just like for any business you know um i'm just conscious of time and i just want to make sure we can at least ask one or one or two more of these uh questions in the q in the in the q it's been dropped in the q and a um so this is an interesting question i wanted to ask you guys which has come from cynthia thank you um so she was effectively been told in the past that it's who you know in the fashion industry i think we've all heard um particularly if you're to be successful as a person of color do you think that's still a case now um if that was ever the case i personally think that it's it's not necessarily at the beginning like uh if like i didn't necessarily have a huge fashion network but i just worked really hard to make a project that i was hoping that would attract attention so i made a book sweet lassie and i released it on the same day as my graduate show and they were both intertwined and so it got quite a lot of traction and that's how how I, st- I guess my platform started but i definitely like kind of what bianca was saying earlier believe that it's not who you know in terms of that like you know if i get applications for um for interns and stuff like that we look at the portfolio and if the work's good they're going to come in um for an interview but i think once you start your own brand you definitely need to build that network to be successful because we already wear so many hats within a brand we can't be a stylist we can't do hair and makeup we can't do you know we can't be a photographer we can't be everything all the time so that's where i think who you know becomes important but i don't think that that necessarily means that um you get your leg up i think that just supports your business i don't think well, I don't, I don't think anything as far as I know Bianca and Nicholas quite well. And I don't think there's anything that we've been given because of who we know. Um, mm. People might, people come to us because they're attracted by our work, but I don't think, I don't feel I've ever got a leg up because of someone. I don't know. So I guess you, it's who you know in terms, my puppy is like in the studio and it's about to bark, sorry. Um, it's who you know in terms of your own network and what you create, but I don't necessarily think it's how you work your way up. But it could be for other people. I know for sure it is, but for us three, it's not. So it doesn't have to be for you. Yeah. I think I feel like it's all about the power of the work first. Then, it, then that's where the who you know comes next. So, like if you if you create good work and and you're like a hardworking person and you're determined to make it be seen, like I think what has even from like um, I don't know studying stage, I always made the internet my power tool. So like creating the who you know from the internet and that's what like built the brand um and trying to be quite good at that sort of thing um i would say is number one then after it is all the all the rest comes next to you know like no because we're in isolation at the moment so it just the internet's the, the first means to anything mm. no i understood i think it's interesting because i think that question i think you know aren't I think we're kind of answering the question because I think you know once upon a time the fashion industry was just pure unfiltered nepotism you know and it was really was you get your foot in if 
you knew the right people. Um, and not even going far back that far, you know. Uh, so I think that's quite interesting. And, you know, just touching upon what we were, you know, Nick was talking about the idea of needing to build a team. Well, actually, knowing the right people to build out your team is almost just as important, you know. I think just something to um, something to kind of add to that conversation, you know, like knowing the right people to ensure you've got people you trust around you to help, you know, alleviate the stress of running an entire brand that's operating in like multiple time zones. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think for me, like you do need a level of, I'd call it positioning or, you know, I knew I wanted to go to Central Stream Mines because I knew that's where the best, you know, within the industry. And obviously there's a lot of amazing, you know, Westminster, RCA, you know, we've got a really long history of creating great designers. It's so obviously coming from the Midlands, like, you know, um, I did my foundation at De Montfort University, but I knew from that point, you know, if I want to try and push myself to the highest level, I need to be amongst the best of the best. And that decision proved to be like, you know, one of like sort of the best, probably the first big decision that I made. And I was so happy that I managed to get onto the menswear course there. And obviously that was the first step um you know and then you know i wanted to learn more about product and retail so then i started to work at doe street market um to learn more about you know where will my brand go or who do i or how do i communicate this or what are the things that inspire me and like merchandising and all this stuff so i do there has to be some of that from you as an individual that hunger that desire that labor of love which i keep going back to 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 for yourself to try and do that but at the same time you need to have people to let you in to open those doors. Like my first job was Nigel Caborn, a British menswear designer based up north. And he was the only designer to say, Nick, I think you're cool. Your designs are good. I want you to come up. And I went to Newcastle and, you know, I took that because I knew I knew I had to learn about, you know, being a menswear designer, running a small brand. And I went to um, interviews with bigger brands, like I'm not going to name them. And I used to get, oh, yeah, we like you we love your style we love everything but you know you know and then i look around and the only black person is the security guards that's kind of where the living play, playing field needs to happen and progress needs to be made you know also from the top and also from the bottle and in the middle it needs to be like a three-way a three-way kind of um attack so to speak and trying to shake things up but you know for me um one thing i did i didn't i did want to say is um, you know, black women or women of color in menswear. Like, I can't think of any designers, British designers, like uh, even Joe K. Sanford or Oswald Boating. I, I find it really hard and it's amazing. And I'm not just saying it because like Bianca and Priya are my friends. It's amazing to see them in menswear as black women, as black women owners and Grace Wells Bonner, Martine Rose. You know, we've got some of the best in the world in my opinion, who are pushing the boundaries. And I think that needs to be recognized and celebrated on its own. So, um, yeah, that's something which I wanted to say in, in, in terms of that. 100%. You're absolutely you. right. Awesome. Well, look, I think we've got to put it, put it to a close here. Um, but I'd really love to hear the passion from all three of you. Uh, Sasha and Dan, sorry I didn't get to ask your questions. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to Priya, Bianca and Nick, also to the Depop gang for putting this on and obviously the British Fashion Council for being awesome. Um, and yeah, just want to say, you know, a big thanks to everyone involved. Thank you. Thanks very much. See you later. Yeah, catch you in a bit. <laughs>